All right, we are back. We're going to talk about the wood hand stubble that gets burned up at the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 12 through 15. We'll read it again. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Okay, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Okay, so uh, you're going to, you, you know, if you remember the last study there, gold, silver, precious stones, what was the gold? The righteousness of God. And the fact that we are connected to God and we are ambassadors for Him and actually working with God, you know, and getting the truth out and stuff like that. The silver is... Your Bible, your King James Bible, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth. And we see that we have the Word of God, the silver there, but uh, Mystery Babylon, the makeup of her city, she can make merchandise of this silver, but uh, she doesn't want the silver around her. An interesting thing there. What were the precious stones? The precious stones are uh, Christians. Again, you know, what do you have there in terms of how do you get Christians, you know, and stuff? Well, people that you've led to the Lord, people that whose lives you've influenced and things like that that are saved. That's what that's going to be about. All right, so now let's look at wood, hay, and stubble. Turn first to Psalm, the book of Psalms. Psalm 1. Go back there. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. See, what's this have to do with wood? Keep reading. Verse 3. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Okay? And again, a righteous man is likened unto a healthy tree that bears fruit. I mean, and, and you say, but I thought that the wood, hay, stubble thing is a negative thing. Well, it's negative, but we're all connected to it. I need to make that point clear. Um, you can't get away from your flesh. The state, you know, flesh versus the spiritual there. Um, you, you are in your flesh. You're going to have to deal with your flesh. Matthew chapter 7. Back to the New Testament. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. All right. There are good trees out there, and the ones that produce fruit, you know, are the best, in my opinion. Now, it doesn't mean necessarily fruit trees as in apple trees or cherry trees or, you know, mulberry or whatever else, pears, peaches, you know. Um, there are other types of fruit. Technically, an acorn is a fruit. Um, the, you know, different things and stuff like that, it's something that carries the seed, right? And it's distributed, and it spreads out, it grows more trees. But uh, there's bad trees out there, too. Trees, I remember there was one, uh, can't think of what the name of it was, but if you, the bark is like, the resin underneath the bark is actually poisonous and can kill you. Uh, Sinconcha tree or something like that. I don't remember, it's been a while since I studied that, but, you know. And if you work in logging, which I did for a few, you know, years, uh, I shouldn't say years, it wasn't real, real long when I was in logging. It was just kind of a sideline thing I did with wood turning. 
but uh, I studied forestry and logging techniques and things like that. And there's something called a cull tree, C-U-L-L. Okay, if you're looking at a woodlot and you look and you see, okay, there's nice big, tall, straight timber, not many branches, you know, going up through. Those are ones, good ones to log, leave the smaller ones to repopulate and grow. And then you'll see these trees that are just totally crooked and all over the place, diseased, sickly, everything else. That's a cull tree if you're trying to make your woodlot healthy. You can kill that tree, you can fell it and use it for firewood. Don't cut down the nice straight, tall straight timbers for firewood. All right, use the junk trees because you don't want them things producing the seeds and regrowing them bunch more diseased sickly trees. That's just good logging practice. So every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Lord's given some real good sound, real real world advice there. Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. Verse 18 through 20. Now in the morning as he hungered, or excuse me, now in the morning as he returned unto the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon. It's not producing fruit, but leaves only. And said unto it, let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, how soon is the fig tree withered away? lining up with what he said back there in chapter 7. And of course, the fig tree is a representative of Israel. You know, and Israel right now is not bearing very good fruit. Not at all. And they're going to get uh, hewn down very much so and uh, cast into the fire here coming up. A very, very prideful people. Matthew chapter 24 Verse 32 through 33. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Yeah, so again, you have the tie in there. And of course, you have some people, they'll say, well, Jesus rebuked the fig tree and he said, let no fruit grow on thee from henceforward forever. Okay, he's talking about that generation there, right? The generation that rejected him. He's physically on the earth. He's preaching the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. He's there, their Messiah. He's saying, that fig tree right then, boom, you're done, you're cursed. But then he you know, restores Israel in the future. So you can't use that text to teach replacement theology, unless you're satanic and have an agenda. But this rebirth of Israel is one of the big prophecies of these end times. But let's look at another type of tree. Romans 11. Romans 11. Verse 16 through 24. It says here, For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, wert graft in among them, with, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. So yeah, he's cursed the Jews there in the first century for rejecting him as their Messiah, but they're coming back. And again, you know, you can make application in here to the fact of if you start messing around with the Jews, God has a future plan for them. If you're trying to say they should be wiped off the face of the earth, they're just, they're false, they're this, they're that, uh, it's dangerous. God will condemn a nation for doing that. He will cut you off from his blessings as he did back in the Old Testament with the Jews. 
Um, verse 24. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature, and wert graft, in, graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Yeah. I'm grafted in to that olive tree. I'm, I'm not a natural olive tree. I'm not a uh, Jew. Okay, I'm a, my ancestors were Germans. All right, so I'm grafted in there. But for me to go and say I'm a German living in America and I hate the Jews over there, that's dangerous. It's very, very dangerous. God can destroy your nation and bring curses upon your nation if you turn against the Jewish people over there and start saying ridiculous stuff like they have no right to that land. Yes, they do. I'd stay away from anybody that starts teaching replacement theology. I'd stay far away from them. God has future plans for those Jews. And you say, oh, he's just going to restore them in spite of the fact that he hates them. Uh, no. Um, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, most of them are going to be killed. It's going to be a terrible time for those Jewish people, much worse than the Holocaust in the days of you know, Adolf Hitler. John 4, verse 22 says, Ye worship, ye know not what, but we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Yep. Romans 11, verses 25 through 28. Let's continue reading here. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part, some Jews still get saved, in other words, Blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, and as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. It's so funny because these stupid replacement theology people, they'll say, we're the Jews now. Well, then how do you work this stuff out here? You know? Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in, become in, and so all Israel shall be saved. Okay, if the church is Israel, then that means that the church isn't saved yet. And they will be sometime in the future, when the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Replacement theology people are rather stupid. Verse 27. Actually, verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Okay? God has plans for them. Like I said, I'd be real careful. If you start messing around with this replacement theology stuff, it's very, very, very dangerous to get into that. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation 11, verses 3 through 4. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees... What we just read in Revel or Romans 11? Kind of interesting. Romans 11, Revelation 11. Hmm. Coincidental. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And for the posties out there, let me ask you a question. Um, what is the point of God sending Moses and Elijah back? The two witnesses there. And I've taught that in other studies. It's definitely Moses and Elijah. What's the point? If it's the church that's the main, you know, central theme of the Great Tribulation. It's not called that, by the way. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble or Daniel's 70th week. But what's the point? I don't need to see Moses and Elijah. The Jews do. The Jews require a sign. That's why the book of Revelation is all about signs. The Lord proving to the Jews that uh, He's their Messiah. Okay? Hey, what is hay? The flesh. Okay? Your life and health. Isaiah 40, verses 6 through 8. You're going to see that all three of these things are actually types of the flesh. Isaiah 40, verses 6 through 8.
It says here, the voice said, cry, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Hmm. You know, uh, how big of a threat are Westcott and Hort to the King James Bible right now? None. They're in hell. Um, what about uh, some of these other people that have, all the popes and things like that that have attacked the Bible over the years? Kept it out of their city, overthrew it when they felt like it. They're in hell. Hmm. But I bet that they're, in their day, I bet they were really something to be feared. Now they're gone. Hmm. It's kind of an interesting thing. First Timothy 4, verses 8 and 9. And by the way, it goes for you too, Christian. Your body is fading away. You're getting older. You'll be surprised sometimes how weak and sickly you can become. First Timothy 4, verses 8 and 9. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all, accept, all acceptation. Um, you'll get to a point where you'll realize you have to take better care of yourself. You have to start watching out for your health. Because if you go through bad health for a while, you'll start to realize, I don't really like this. It's not about, well, you know, we're all going to die. Uh, yeah, we're all going to die of something. But uh, how do you want to live your life up until that point of death? In sickness and bad health and everything? No, you got to be in good shape physically. Proper nutrition, proper rest, and exercise. Those are the three legs of the stool of good health, so to speak. You know, you take one of the legs off, the stool falls over. Um, you can have good, you know, be eating good food and getting plenty of sleep, but if you're not exercising, you're going to have a problem. And you can do that with all three points. But if you're doing those things and forsaking the word of the Lord and all the other things that go along with that, your priorities are wrong. And uh, there's going to be a lot of people, I think, that get to the judgment seat of Christ and they're going to be watching that hay burn up. The Lord's going to say, boy, you sure spent a lot of time taking care of that body, didn't you? It's a shame you didn't sacrifice some of that health to serve me. I've had to do it and you got you got to balance it. I, I understand that. you got to do all things in moderation. You know, you got to balance that stuff. But there have been many times when I should have gotten exercise and whatever else, and um, I'm just like, I got work to do for the Lord. I got to get this thing done. I got to answer somebody. I got to get these sermon notes done uh, right now. I do not feel like preaching this sermon, but I realize I got to get this thing done because we're, we're here and working at our property, and it's just like a lot of work and things. I'm just going to have to deal with it, tough it up, you know. I preached many, many times when I've been sick. Many times. You just have to deal with that type of, of, of thing. Let's continue here. James chapter 1. James 1. Verses 9 through 11. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. Like hay. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. I mean, how many rich people, you know, you say things to, to young people about movie stars from the 1920s or something like that, and they don't even know who they are. You know, even 1950s, 1960s, a lot of young people go, who? But boy, they were world famous back years ago. You go back to the 1800s and talk you know, royal families and popular people and whatever else, most people are just going to be like, I don't remember, you know, who's that? What happened? Well, the grass withered and faded away. You're going to wither and fade away too. I mean, can you tell me, can you name 
10 Christians from the 1700s that lived in the 18th century. In other words, can you name me 10 Christians that lived back then that really did something for the Lord? Well, you might be able to think of a few heroes of the faith, you know, kind of the deal or whatever else. But the average Christian, you don't know who they are. It's important to spend your time. Keep yourself in good health, brethren. Absolutely. Very important. Okay? You keep under your body and bring it into subjection lest you be cast away. Understand that. But, remember, our time is very short. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. You have to weigh that thing out. Am I able to do this thing? Am I able to witness or this or that? Or for me, I got video to do or whatever. I don't really feel like doing it, but I got to get the truth out there. This is what I do. Wait out, brethren. First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, verse 23 through 25. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. It's about the book. Silver. This ring here. Uh, it's a silver ring. Not a very expensive ring, but you know, it's kind of a work ring and things like that. Silver. You know, I could take this thing outside and I could throw that thing down on our property and come back a month later, the flowers are going to be gone. And the weeds and stuff like that, the grass will be gone, the hay, but that ring is still going to be there. Psalm 138, verse 2, if you remember from the first part of the study, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Yes, the Bible is very, very important. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15 says, And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Boy, you'll see that in your life as a Christian. You will spend your health, you will spend your time, you will spend your money, you will do all kinds of things to serve the Lord sometimes. A lot of times Christians won't appreciate it. But the Lord will. That's the reason for the time of Jacob's trouble. Excuse me. That's the reason for the, for the judge, judgment seat of Christ. I mean, I, one of these days I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a whole sermon without messing up. Maybe, you know, probably not. Oh, boy. Stubble, according to Webster's 1828 Dictionary, says, The stumps of wheat, rye, barley, oats, or buckwheat left in the ground the part of the stalk left by the scythe or sickle. After the first crop is off, they plow in the stubble. Hmm. This is an interesting one here. Turn to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, verses 20 through 24. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be light by life or death, or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you." Again, you know, um, you know, it's kind of rough sometimes being tied to this body of death. You know, just looking here, I don't know if I have that verse, but, you know, uh, turn over to Romans chapter 7. I'll just show you this real quick. Remember, the stubble is something that's left in the ground, you know, 
kind of interesting. Romans chapter 7, verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? You're tied to, I mean, we have an eternal soul and the Spirit of God within us. You're going to live forever. It's an amazing promise from the Lord. But you're tied to a body that gets sore and that deals with pain, you know, and gets older. You know, kind of rough. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire... Fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Okay? Turn to First Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Verses 4 through 7. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse, Nurse cherisheth her children. Okay? Again, what is your motivation for serving the Lord? Is it to elevate that flesh? Is it to make yourself feel better and make yourself look better? You know, again, what's the, what's the deal with monetizing your account? What is that? Elevation of the flesh? You're looking for more money? You're looking to have your face known much better and get the secular world to kind of promote your channel and stuff better? Why? You're trying to please men. Say, oh no, come on, brother. Aren't you trying to get more people to go and click on those ads? So you get more revenue coming in? You're a man pleaser. Galatians 1.10 says, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. You can't be a man pleaser in ministry. Matthew 6, verses 2, or well, verse 2. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. And they certainly do. Verse 5, Matthew 6, verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Yep, Matthew 6, verse 16. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Talked about that in the study on Christian fasting. And, um, you know, men pleasers, the reward that they get is here in this life. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1 verse 26 down through verse 29. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Again, that's what this whole thing is about. When you serve the Lord, if you're serving the Lord out of a fleshly desire... 
to make your flesh look better and to, and to just be the coolest thing out there and popular and whatever else and the greatest you know Christian of all time and blah 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 your motives are wrong you're a man pleaser and that will show up at the judgment seat of Christ that's where it's going to end up you're going to watch Watch your uh, work get burned up. Second Timothy chapter 2. Turn there. I did a lot of my sermons differently back years and years ago. So I'm a little sorry I'm, I'm hesitating on some of this because there's like a lot of notes that I have written out. And I'm just trying to go over the scriptures and just kind of looking at some of the notes and things. But... Um, Things have changed over the years with me <laughs> as far as, uh, you know, I try to stick with the scriptures more and things now um, as much as I can. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 through 25. And a servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Hmm. Um... I'm going to admit to a fault. Uh, a lot of times I get very wrapped up in the war, spiritual warfare type of stuff where I'm attacking people that are just preaching false doctrine, and um, which Jesus did, Paul did, uh, any Christian is going to do that. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Uh, 1 Corinthians talks about that. I, it is my job to rebuke things and whatever. But I will be the first to admit that there have been times when my pride gets the better of me and I go after that stuff and I'm, I'm, I'm not feeding the flock of God like I should be and I'm going after those guys. And I'm going to be doing a study in the, in the future because uh, the Lord's really been speaking to me about this thing of uh, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind and if the blind lead the blind they shall both fall into the ditch. I don't do that enough. And uh, the truth is there. I mean, there's so many of the things that, that the Lord's helped me to preach over the years, and, and it's backed up by Scripture, and it, is, it says what it is. And, you know, it's just, it's there. You don't accept it? Well, and you say, I'm following whoever, the people that I've rebuked and exposed over the years. Okay. I need to just get to a point where I just let them alone. And, you know, the disciples in that passage, they came to Jesus and they're saying, don't you know what the Pharisees are saying about you? And Jesus turns to them and he says, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. Sometimes I'm not always as gentle as I should be or as meek as I should be. And sometimes it can start getting to my pride. And I got to examine myself and you have to examine yourself too. You know, we all do. And we have to look and say, how is this going to show up at the judgment seat of Christ? What's my motivation for the ministry the Lord's given me? Whatever it is. What is it? Is it going to be burned? Am I really showing God's righteousness, the gold? Elevating this book to the position of authority? Glorifying this book? The silver? Am I really concerned for Christians out there, the precious stones? Or is this some wood, hay, and stubble? I mean, you have wood and stubble. It's your flesh. It's there. You are tied to a dead corpse. You are tied to this thing. I mean, the Lord Jesus himself, you know, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He didn't want to go through the pain that he was going to be going through on that cross. I can understand. I can't even fathom doing that when you don't even deserve it, <laughs> you know. But he did it for you and for me. Praise God he did. But uh, the flesh is weak. Wood, hay, and stubble. And that flesh will say, just, you know, let's put that Bible away for now. Look at this shiny new catalog that just came. Look at the cool stuff in there that you can covet after. Hey, remember that old song you used to listen to? Boy, it was such a neat song. Why don't we go listen to that? Oh, come on, you got stuff to do. Don't put that gospel track down there. Kick yourself, okay? I'm doing my own kicking of myself here. All right, let's continue. <laughs> Excuse me. 
The five crowns of reward, we're going to go over that next. Okay, there are five different crowns mentioned. I've heard some people say, well, actually, it's just five different descriptions of one crown or something like this or whatever. I don't know. I teach it as five crowns. Um, a lot of the stuff, it's eternal. It's an eternal thing, so I'm not going to argue much over it with people. I'm not going to condemn people as heretics if they say it's one crown with five aspects to it, kind of like the fruit of the Spirit. There are nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. The Bible does not say in Galatians, it does not say the fruits, plural, of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? One Holy Spirit, and there are nine different, you know, characteristics to that fruit. So could it be that there's five different characteristics of one crown or something? Or maybe, I don't know. Again, I'm not going to argue with people on that. Uh, but let's look at the different crowns that are mentioned here. Understanding what I'm saying. First Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 19 through 20. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Crown of rejoicing. What's that one? Well, uh, it relates to the precious stones, the Christians. So people that you've helped to get saved and things, you've led them to the Lord and things, you know, and again, this thing of leading people to the Lord. Okay, um, whenever you open your mouth about Jesus Christ, you are basically putting someone in contact with the Lord. All right, this thing of, oh, I got I to gotta bow your head, but close your eyes, and repeat this prayer after me. That person might be totally lying to you. All right, you know, people have these funny notions about stuff. But my point is, the crown of rejoicing there is given to, you know, you, you know some people say it's a soul winner's crown and things like that. How many precious stones have you influenced or whatever in your life? The next one is the incorruptible crown. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 24 through 27. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every one that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. You see the incorruptible crown. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body, talked about this earlier, and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. You have to you have to balance this thing, and it's so challenging because your flesh is constantly fighting against you. Your flesh is constantly saying, "It's okay, you know, the sugar's not going to hurt you. It's not going to kill you, you know. Just you know a little bit of that and some some other junk food and stuff. It's not going to kill you, whatever." And then you feel tired, and you you know, and and then the flesh will also go the other direction and say, "You know, you got to get in really good shape." And and all of a sudden, next thing you know, you're doing all this exercise stuff and all this health thing and whatever else, and there's just no time to read the Bible. So it's just like, ah, you know, it's rough. The flesh will get you both ways. So what do you do? Keep under your body. Body starts to say, well, I'm going to do this and do that. You kind of go grab it and, no, nope, hold on here. We're not going to go, we're not going to eat that junk food. It's time to read the Bible. Oh, and we're not going to go out and exercise right now. We'll, uh, we'll deal with that. Uh, a little bit later, if we have time, we're going to read the Bible. And uh, you get a crown for that. The judgment seat of Christ, the Lord's going to look at that and He's going to say, you had that thing done right. Moderation, you practiced that moderation. You didn't let your body just go. You didn't let your health go. But you kept your body in good enough shape that you were able to serve me with your life. Eat a bunch of junk food and die when you're 30 years old, or eat good, stay in good shape, get plenty of rest and things like that, and live to be 80, 90 years old. I don't think most people are going to get that far, you know, today before the rapture, but, you know, if you're younger, but, uh, you know, I think you know what I'm saying. 
Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Good instruction in righteousness. Wherefore, seeing that we, are, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, I have a theory. I'll share it with you. Okay? My theory is, I believe that when Moses and Elijah come back, they're going to be preaching Revelation, obviously. They'll be reading that. But I think the two books that they're going to be preaching to the Jews over there in Jerusalem is Hebrews and James. You know? Can you imagine Moses and Elijah standing there and the Jews, you know, they're going to be like, Moses and Elijah? And they're doing miracles and stuff like this. And, you know, the goons are coming to, to get them and they're, you know, devouring them with fire and things. And they say, turn in your Bible to the book of Hebrews. The Jews will be going, what? <laughs> Let us look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. They're going, Moses? Moses? Elijah? What, what are you saying? <laughs> I mean, you know, I could go farther and say I think it'd be King James Bible, but, you know, probably have some Hebrew scriptures or something like that. Just as long as it comes from the Masoretic Hebrew text, okay? Not the uh, Stuttgartensia. Another issue. Next, we have the crown of glory. Let's look at this one. 1 Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter five, the next crown that's mentioned. First Peter chapter five, verses one through four. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God. It's kind of funny, because way back when uh, Jesus comes up from the dead, you know, and stuff, and they're walking around with him and things, and end of the book of John, and he goes, Hey Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Feed my sheep. <laughs> Says it to him three times. And what's he say? Feed the flock of God. A few years there, Peter got it through the old thick noggin up here, you know. He had it. Finally. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre. Remember, they have their reward. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. You can teach the word, you can whatever, but you have to be an example too. Verse 4, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Crown of glory. Next we have the crown of righteousness. This is another good one. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4 verses 6 through 8. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. I should mention too, First Peter chapter 5 there, it's talking about feeding people and things like that. And it doesn't, you don't have to be in a ministry full-time like I am or whatever. You know, If you're not in full-time ministry, you don't get the crown of glory. Uh, no, you're just feeding and exhorting the brethren, no matter what position you're in. But here is this one. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Do you love the appearing of Jesus Christ? Or if you're a postie, you're looking for the Antichrist. And they all are. Now, they'll they'll try to get around it and... Oh, we're not, you know, we're, I'm anxious to see Jesus, but they aren't going to see Jesus until they see the Antichrist first. That's what they believe. And I, you know, I had a, a young woman write in the comments here this past week, and she said about, you know, you're lying and you're, 
attitude's rotten and yeah i know but uh and and i said well here's basically how you break this whole thing down there's only two possibilities two possible ways to look at the future number one jesus christ saved me and he loved me enough to die in my place to save me from the wrath to come not just hell but his judgment that comes on this earth and i'm looking forward to seeing jesus my savior or the second possibility, Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins and He loved me somewhat because He's going to put me through the same judgment that's coming on lost people. When I go out there in the world and I hear the profanity and I hear all the other wickedness and everything else, I'm going to hit the same judgment that those people are. Fire, war, death, famine, all the other stuff. Why? And I could lose my salvation if I take the mark. Those are the two possibilities, two ways to look at it. If, I'll, if you're a post-tribber, you're looking for the Antichrist. Because as soon as the Antichrist shows up, you say, we were right. See, pre-trib fib, the pre-trib rapture lie. It's all been false, aren't you? It's exactly what these people believe. It is the exact thing that they believe. They're looking for the Antichrist to justify their teaching. As soon as the Antichrist shows up, they're going to be going, Pre-Tribble's a lie! We've been right the whole time! They're excited to see the Antichrist. Because then it justifies their belief system. They can't love the appearing of Jesus Christ. They love the appearing of the Antichrist. And you say, oh, that's not true. We love the appearing of Jesus. Okay. When do you know he's going to appear? Is it some random time in the future or when the Antichrist appears so that you can mark out seven years from then? Hmm. Interesting. So you can't get away from it. If you're a postie, you're looking for the Antichrist. Number five, you have the crown of life. And I put a question mark beside this one. James 1 verse 12. James 1 verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Now, why did I put a question mark beside it? Well, this one's in the book of James. To the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. James 1 verse 1. Is this one really for a Christian? I don't know. Turn to Revelation 2, verse 10. Revelation 2, verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Written to the seven churches. So, yes, you can make the argument that a martyr, somebody that gets cast into prison, somebody that's killed for the Lord, um, they're probably going to get that crown. But it's interesting because you actually have a saint in the time of Jacob's trouble who is crowned. Hmm. Let's see what I have here. You say saints that are crowned for losing their lives? James chapter 1 there. Go back to Revelation 20. I've been studying for my uh, expository study, Bible-believing expository study on Revelation 20. And I keep hitting this thing. It's like, yep, right there it is. Uh, Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment, judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Martyrs from the time of Jacob's trouble. And they're seated on thrones. Now, if I don't miss my guess, people that sit on thrones wear crowns. So I find it rather interesting that right now in the church age, you basically have five different types of crowns that you can earn. Again, we'll just stick with that for the sake of argument. Five different crowns that you can earn. But at the time of Jacob's trouble, one of those crowns goes into that time. The one about being martyred. 
Pretty interesting. Now, can you lose rewards at the judgment seat of Christ? Interesting. Revelation 3, verse 11. Actually, we'll go up to verse 10. Revelation 3, 10 and 11 says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Did you know a false prophet can come along and take your rewards away? They can take your crown. They can get you sidetracked into some kind of a false doctrine, some kind of a false uh, teaching or whatever else, and they can take your crown from you. Yeah, absolutely. Second John, the book of Second John. Second John, verse 8. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Yeah. You don't want to lose the things that you've wrought. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. Verses 3 through 5. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. My two favorite verses. Verse 5. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. you got to do things God's way. Say, well, brother, I led, we, we led 3,000 people to the Lord last weekend on our soul-winning crusade. Did you really? What was your technique? Did you go out there and actually look and see, are these people really convicted of sin? Or are you just high-pressure salesman tactics using that to get them to pray a prayer and then say, they're saved? You have to strive lawfully. Oh, I, I make really good videos with lots of entertainment and, and music and you know amazing things and emotion and whatever else. Really getting people saved? Well, I like to be in ministry, but I sure don't like to quote much scripture. You're not striving lawfully. You're not going to be crowned. It's important. Now, when will the judgment seat of Christ take place? Revelation 4. Revelation chapter 4. Verses 10 and 11. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. I mean, again, what, what a picture. You know, the Lord places a crown on your head at the judgment seat of Christ, and these 24 elders, they, they're there, and they take the crown off and they throw it before the throne. All glory and honor goes to the Lord in heaven. You know, again, people have these funny notions of what heaven's going to be. This wonderful place where you go and everything that you've ever desired and wanted on the earth is what you're going to get up there. That isn't it. Heaven is about Jesus Christ. And believe me, if you're saved, you want to see Him glorified. You want to be in a place where nobody's going to be a hypocrite and nobody's going to be contradictory and there's not going to be any divisions and church splits and whatever else. You want to be in the presence of Jesus Christ and saints that are straightened out because they've been given the mind of Christ. Looking forward to it. Revelation 5, verses 8 through 12. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Kings wear crowns. And I beheld and heard, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, 
and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So, I can't tell you the exact time frame of the judgment seat of Christ, but it clearly happened before the first seal is opened. Now, you know, of course, we're in eternity, so, you know, the rapture could happen and an hour later, the Antichrist could confirm the covenant, Daniel 9, 27, and start the time of Jacob's trouble. Certainly, I realize that, you know, eternity you don't have time like we do here but the whole point is the judgment seat of christ takes place sometime between rapture and the antichrist being unleashed on the earth in revelation 6 1 and 2. unless you're a posty then you know you kind of go up at some point in time and you come right back down to the earth or whatever if you're a post-tribber mid-trib you know well you'll be there for a little bit longer but most of them don't they don't talk about the judgment seat of christ it's kind of interesting So, that's going to be it for this study. I'm going to end with a little story here. Um, I remember this from the original study, and, and it's a convicting story. Uh, back when I was young, I remember in, in uh, school, elementary school and things like this, they'd have these fundraiser deals, and you're supposed to sell candy bars to all your relatives and neighbors and whatever else. And uh, you're given this box of candy bars, you know. You take them home and you're like trying to sell them to people and then you end up just taking your allowance and buying a couple of them and you're sitting there in your room eating chocolate bars, you know. <laughs> and uh, I remember I, I never really took the thing seriously, you know, and, and I'd, you know, I'd go and maybe ask people at the church building I grew up, you know, would you like to buy a candy bar? And I was always like, uh, you know, and I just thought, now oh, I got better things to do than sell these stupid candy bars. But that day would come when, uh, They'd assemble you there in the cafeteria or the whatever, the assembly room or whatever at the school. And they'd say, okay, now we're going to give out the rewards. And you'd, all of a sudden you start thinking, oh, okay, I wonder what I'm going to get. And you look down, you've sold like six candy bars or something, you know. And uh, they start giving out the rewards. Oh, how many did you get? You know, and you get whatever, whatever. And they say, okay, the number one you know, student that sold the most candy bars is so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, all of a sudden you look over there and it's like there's this new bike or something, you know, and, and it's like this kid that sold 400 candy bars or something. They're like, here you go, congratulations. And you're looking down at your crummy little eraser or something that you got or, you know, whatever the gift or the prize was. And you're looking at that thing and you're going, looking at his bike going, sure wish I'd have spent more time selling candy bars. See, that's going to be the suffer loss when we hit the judgment seat of Christ. It isn't going to be a thing of like being there and like, oh no, okay, Lord. And, and he's like, why did you fall for this? You know, as I said earlier. And he's not going to threaten you with sending you to hell. You're going to be looking into the eyes of Jesus Christ and, and he's going to be saying, I sure wish I could have given you more. I sure wish you'd have done more for me with your life. I sure wish... I had so much I could have given you. Here you go. A few little pieces of gold and silver and some precious stones. And the Lord says, oh, all right, let's look and see what you did with your life. Boy, you sure we're in good shape. You sure did a lot of neat things and a lot of fun things and whatever else. Bonfire. What you did for yourself, what you did to glorify yourself, it all gets burned. And only what you've done for the Lord. The gold. How much of His righteousness are you proclaiming to people and showing through your own life? What's your testimony? I saw a bumper sticker many years ago. I've talked about this different studies. And it said, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? People all in the neighborhood, do they know that you're saved? Or do you just kind of blend in? Gold, brethren. Silver. Are you afraid to defend God's book? Do you laugh at the King James onlyism? Or do you stick your neck out there and let people make fun of you and yell at you and stuff like this and show your relatives, hey, you're using an NIV? I got some things to show you. Look at this. 
You want to blow somebody's mind that's using NIV, you just say, let's compare scriptures. Your scriptures are easier to understand and stuff. Oh, yes. You say, okay, turn to Acts 8.37. I'll read mine, then you read yours. And watch it. It's the, one of the most fun things that you can do. They're, they're scanning, they're going, 37, verse 37. You know, and they look at you, this bewildered look like, it's not in there, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, open door. I mean, I've done that so many times to people, and they get mad, you know, you're saying to my new version, my NIV or my new American Standard. Well, I don't know about the new American Standard. I'm not sure if they take it out, but I know the NIV does. And um, they question the footnotes and stuff, the new American Standard. But And, uh, you know, you do it with the NIV, and they're, the people get all defensive, and you say, just look it up. Just look it up. Show it to me. And they look it up, and they go, it's not in there, you know. Defending the silver. Precious stones, what have you done to lead people to Jesus Christ? What are you doing for the stones in your life, the precious stones in your life? I mean, you know, I, I'm very blessed by the fact that a lot of you form fellowships that it's like I don't even have to be there and, like, okay, take one person's hand and somebody else's hand and, you know, here, talk to each other. I don't need to do that. I don't need to form some building someplace, some cult building somewhere where you people can come and worship me and, you know, have Pastor Appreciation Day and all this other stuff. You don't need to do that. You say, well, praise the Lord, Brother Brian, you know, loves the Lord and he's going to preach his word without compromise. And uh, we support him. We'll pray him, pray for him, you know, and things like that. Praise the Lord. Hey, great. You know, but you form your own fellowships and you strengthen the brethren. That brings great joy to my heart. Precious stones. Are there precious stones in your life? People that shine a little bit brighter than the uh, lost world out there? People that you really love in the Lord? I've got some of you. Some of you are really dear and, and you know, near and dear to me. I appreciate your friendship. So, that's going to be it. Very convicting. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you that uh, not only have you saved uh, us, but I just thank you, Lord, for taking us and putting us into some kind of a ministry of some sort. And Lord, I pray that we would be open to that and we would think about the gold and the silver and the precious stones that are going to mean everything to us in eternity and how the wood, hay, and stubble just isn't going to mean a thing to us. We'll look back at it and remember it and say, I'm sure glad I'm away from all that stuff with the flesh. I just pray, Lord, that you would bring great conviction upon all of us, and I include myself in that. Uh, help me to be more diligent about your work, Lord, and um, be more bold in witnessing with people and, and, and uh, all the different things, Lord, that are, I know I'm supposed to be doing, and my flesh fights it. I just pray, Lord, that uh, we would stay focused on what matters the most. And I just ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, that is going to be it for this two-part study. A lot of scriptures to go over. Um, as I'm redoing these studies and things, you know, going from audio to video now, uh, I'm not going to be reading word for word as I did many years ago. Um, like I said, my style's kind of changed now. I used to write out everything that, you know, I'll just show you here quick. You know, here's what the old notes look like. You can see the date up there, but, you know, you can see I'd write out everything, all the different points I had to make. And um, I don't do that much anymore. I just kind of put the scriptures down and maybe a little thought or two, you know, whatever. But uh, it, so it's a little bit, you know, uh, maybe not real smooth <laughs> coming out. But I hope and pray that uh, you get convicted about this. Um, this is one I've been very anxious to redo. Um, just to get it out there again as a reminder. Um, you can listen to the old study. You can listen to the new one that we, you know, I just did here. Um, both are good because it reminds you. It's, it's a reminder. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ someday and give an account of what we've done in the body that we have, how we spend our time. So 
that is going to be it. And we will see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching.